Hi, everyone. Today, um, welcome to the eighth episode of the Atino Base eSeminar series 2021. My name is Luba, and I'll be today's host. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming and introducing today's guest speaker, Dr. Paige Mandelier Ruiz. Dr. Mandelier Ruiz received a PhD in chemistry from the University of Florida under the guidance of Dr. Sandra Luzgen in 2020. Her research has focused on, marine, on natural marine products produced by marine derived sources and their potential bioactivity and ecological roles. Paige's projects have examined the marine derived fungus, Aspergillus elaeaceus, as a source of new cytotoxic biathrones as a result of gene activation techniques. She has also explored the chemical, bio, um, the chemical symbiotic relationship between Nigeria and their symbionts. As of March 2021, she started a postdoctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian Marine Station under the guidance of Dr. Valerie Poor. Her current project involves isolating and studying natural products produced by a potential bacterial probiotic from the tissue of Floridian corals. So the aim of the research is to combat stony tissue loss disease that is affecting the Florida reef tract. The title of today's talk, Isolating Coral Derived Actinobacteria as Probiotics for the Treatment of Stony Coral Tissue Loss Diseased Florida Corals. Hi Paige, right, it's, a, it's great to finally have you here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much to the organizers for letting me uh, present my talk uh, for my so far six months into my research. Um, so I will be talking about some of the actinobacteria I've derived from the last six months. And to begin with, I want to just get you oriented with coral reefs. So coral reefs are much a very fruitful provider for many things, many different roles. About 25% of all marine life depends on coral reefs. And this includes habitat feeding, spawning, and oftentimes a nursery for smaller invertebrates and vertebrates. Protection of coastal infrastructure against storm surges such as hurricanes. And could be potential sources of medicine as we've seen for some, for some of our FDA approved drugs. Not just for the marine life, but also people who live along the coral reef ecosystems, about half a billion live and depend on these reef systems. This includes recreation and tourism, such as snorkeling and fishing, which is estimated to bring about 10, almost $10 billion in tourism to local economies. Also food is provided on these reefs and that support the local population. For today's talk, I will be specifically talking about the Florida Reef Track, where I am not too far from. I am located just a couple, about 20, 30 miles north of where the Florida Reef Track starts. It is the continental U.S.'s only, the only extensive shallow coral reef system, which encompasses about 380 miles of uh, Florida coast. This is home to 45 different reef species, reef building stony coral tissue, excuse me, stony coral species that reside in the reef track. It is also home to about 1400 different species, including some of the fish about with 500 species residing. The economic value that it brings to the state of Florida is around almost a little over $1 billion in tourism. Now what makes up a, a coral reef system specifically in the Florida reef track. Most of the corals that may be observed on the reef track are characterized as stony corals where they have a characterized by their hard skeleton of calcium carbonate which you will often see residing on the beach or when corals tend to bleach. They are the bedrock of the coral reef ecosystem and they often have a very thin layer of polyps, of tiny polyps, as you can see in this photo. Soft corals, are, such as these sea pens, are fleshy without hard skeleton. And so you will see these, uh, these two co-inhabiting co on the same reef system. Most of these corals have, form a symbiotic relationship to xanthelli, so they're the photosynthetic partners that exchange nutrients within the animal. But in terms of the coral, that's not the only thing that it encompasses. 
As a whole, the coral is composed of uh, considered a holobiont, where it consists of the coral animal itself, endocellular microalgae such as symbiodinaceae, and a microbiome containing bacteria, fungi, archaea, cyanobacteria, protists, etc. It is hypothesized that this microbiota, for example, can modulate its microorganism population with respect to the environment, obtaining the most advantageous microbiota. Roles of these microorganisms include nutrient cycling, intercellular communication, host physiology functions such as immunity, defense, and reproduction. And often these microorganisms in a healthy coral holobiont are stable and specialist sets of microorganisms. In today's talk, we're focus on, focusing on the bacterial population. In terms of the dominant phyla that we see in coral microbiota studies, proteobacteria, specifically alpha and gamma species, make up the majority, followed by actinobacteria and cyanobacteria. Other phyla, such as the bacteriodes and the firmicutes, may re be responsible for onset microbialization, such as the environmental shifts in the waters, et cetera. For an initial healthy reef system that we often see for the microbiota bi biome uh, setup shift, excuse me, the microbiome, we often see that there is a stable population of bacteria and the symbiodinaceae, the dinoflagellates that are the symbiotic partners. However, these microbiomes can often shift and ultimately break down over time with prolonged thermal stress and acidification. The dominant microbial population is often unable to fight off any opportunistic pathogens that may lead to this uh, ultimate breakdown of the holobiont. As we see over certain stages, we have this red, which indicates some opportunistic pathogens such as Vibrio species that will increase its population and overtake many of the natural native microbiota population. And often these holobionts are, the health of the holobionts are affected and dependent on biotic factors such as pathogens, genetics, et cetera, as well as temperature and pH and nutrients from the abiotic. Ultimately, we end up seeing with a dysbiosis with the breakdown of the microbiota, we'll see many of the coral reefs experiencing bleaching or some sort of tissue degradation. Currently in one of the tissue loss disease that is affecting several different reef systems is called stony coral tissue loss disease. This is a rapid progressive disease where it specifically affects stony corals. As you can see in this picture, we have healthy tissue, which is a nice brown coloring, but is receded and leaving behind the calcium carbonate uh, skeleton. Mortality ranges from one week for small colonies to over one to two months to la for large, larger colonies. And this specifically affects many of the reef building species such as boulder and brain corals. This uh, tissue, stony coral tissue loss disease appeared in the Florida reef track around 2014. And as of 2021, it has completely been affected across all of the entire Florida reef track, including the dry tortugas, which were once left untouched by this disease. This has expanded into other subtropical reef systems, such as the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and other Caribbean area, other Gulf of Mexico subtropical areas. Over half of the 45 Caribbean reef building coral species are affected, with five of them being endangered. And over Almost 100,000 acres have been affected by this disease. So understanding the pathogenesis and this, uh, of stony coral tissue loss, as well as treatments for this disease are an urgent area of research. So what has been found in similar coral disease outbreaks, such as uh, the white syndrome found in some of the Hawaiian corals, despite having disease neighbors, not all corals are affected by this disease, indicating that the microbiota present may play a role in susceptibility in to infections. 
Stony coral tissue loss disease may show a similar pattern. So one proposed mechanism for treatment is using probiotics. The use of living beneficial microorganisms derived from a healthy microbiota could aid in the treatment of stony coral tissue loss disease, which will provide a non-harmful continuous treatment over time compared to the traditional antibiotic treatments. So we already use probiotics in our everyday life, such as our digestive support of a Lyme probiotic and even our yogurts. And this is also nothing new in the state of aquaculture as this is used in many of the fish feeds as well as the shrimp used in uh, creating our uh, aquaculture food source. So why not antibiotics? Why not just use antibiotics instead of probiotics? Traditionally in the field, antibiotics have used, that have been used were amoxicillin as a paste treated on corals. This is, though the agents of the story coral tissue loss disease haven't been identified, they found that using amoxicillin could halt the lesion progression, which may imply that pathogenic bacteria may be important for the disease progression. The microbial communities at these disease lesion sites often found that the bacteria that were enriched were bacterial orders such as Vibria nails and some other more non-beneficial non bacteria. One particular path, potential pathogen that may exasperate stony coral tissue loss disease and the progression is Vibrio coralyticus may, that may be involved in a co-infection. This Vibrio species so it may sound familiar as it's responsible for outbreaks of disease in various coral and shellfish species in the Indo-Pacific and Mediterranean. One thing to know about this Vibrio coralyticus species or this Vibrio coralyticus strain is that so, several strains have been observed to exhibit multi-drug resistance so many of the traditional antibiotics used in the field, such as amoxicillin, tetracyclines, and aminoglycosidides antibiotics may be rendered useless if this is indeed a potential co-infection to stony coral tissue loss disease. Thus, the use of probiotics as a treatment instead of antibiotics would provide the best treatment to prevent the progression of this tissue loss disease particularly obtaining microorganisms derived from the healthy microbiota in an uh, endemic zone as a probiotic source. So specifically, I am targeting actinobacteria. I don't need to go into so much detail as to why actinobacteria are important as they are a classic and important source of potent natural products, such as doxorubicin, a broadband chemotherapy drug, vancomycin, which is the last resort for a staph aureus resistant strain infection. And of course, the ever controversial ivermectin antiparasitic drug. Still targeting actinobacteria as a source of new natural products, genome mining efforts have indicated that many of the actinobacteria are still underexplored. And the chemical diversity is much higher in actinobacteria while there are still new scaffolds to be discovered. In terms of coral-derived actinobacteria, groups have found several actinobacteria and isolated new strains, but not all have been chemically explored. And even some of the actinobacteria, including streptomyces, have been utilized in aquaculture for growth and protection against some of the vibrionelle pathogens, such as the use of, an, of a streptomyces species to increase the weight of tiger prawns in order to bulk up the size of the coral, or excuse me, the tiger prawn. So how do we get actinobacteria from coral? I wanna thank our uh, Smithsonian Marine Station collaborators, Dr. Christine Kellogg, Christina Kellogg, Dr. Greta Abbey, Dr. Blake Ushijima, and his grad student, Eric Papke. They have been all super welcoming and super wonderful at letting me sample many of their corals that they brought in from the field, as well as leaving some samples for me to use. Three different samples were obtained to isolate actinobacteria from. This includes microbial 
water concentrates using tangential flow filtration. Coral mucus, such as from healthy and disease corals. We're at the disease coral site. I sampled at the lesion site where there's a clear divide of the healthy tissue versus the calcium carbonate, as well as as far away from the lesion site as possible. And one sampling on the healthy coral. I also took whole coral tissues of healthy and diseased and tried to crush them up as best as I could with a scalpel and stamp them out onto agar plates, such as what has been done with um, sediment samples. All the samples were separated into two different uh, treatments, heat shock and non-heat shock. Heat shock would involve five minutes of a 55 C water bath. And all of my isolation plates contain cyclohexamamide and naldixic acid. I used a variety of different media techniques that are classic to natural product bacterial isolation efforts, uh, mainly from Actinobase, which thank you for this wonderful uh, open source uh, platform to see what type of media I could use to get the best number of actinobacteria. I had five different media types I used, three that were rich in nutrients, such as a malt-based agar, a starch, yeast, and peptone, and a soy flour agar, as well as my nutrient limiting, such as actinoisolation agar and a modified marine broth. I wanted to narrow down my selection of isolates as you begin to create these isolation plates, you can get hundreds and hundreds of isolates. And we wanted to remove the vibrionelles for a narrow selection as some vibrionelles, such as Vibrio harvi, harvii may be, and Vibrio corolliticus may be present in the microbiota. And we do not wanna use those as potential probiotics in our case. So we use a thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose agar, TCBS, to narrow down our collection where we would take our isolates here, we would plate them on this TCBS, and if they were yellow, we would remove them from our collection as that indicated a vibrionelle type of strain. Once I obtained, removed all the vibrionelles and I had a bacterial isolate collection, I would move them into my first screening efforts, which is a bacteria-bacteria interaction assay. I would create a lawn of a putative coral pathogen, lawn of two, two different virulent strains of Vibrio corolliticus, and Lysingeria. I would plate them, let them dry, and I would plate my bacterial colonies on top of the pathogen lawn. And I would look for clear zones of inhibition, such as what you see here, so very similar to a disdiffusion. From here, if I found a interesting strain that was active against my potential putative pathogen, I would send the bacterial strain for 16S RNA PCR colony sequencing through GeneWiz. I would grow this large scale in seawater broth or agar, and the extraction would to obtain the natural products would be done with a two to two to one ethyl acetate methanol and water. I wanted to also further see what the most active fraction might be within that extract, and I would do a C18 fractionation of the extracts, generating five different fractions of varying polarity. From there, once I have fractions and extracts of the potential strain in terms of their natural products, I would go back to retest in a disdiffusion assay to make sure I still held my activity against these putative coral pathogens. Again, same thing, two virulent strains of Vibrio corolliticus, as well as a Lysingeria strain. Chemistry was placed on paper discs and played against a lot, the pathogen lawn. The positive control we would use is naldixic acid. We would often have two different characteristics of our, our disc diffusion in terms of what we would score them as. If they were complete, where they had a clear zone of inhibition, this was considered a complete inhibition, a complete zone of inhibition. While partial had this halo effect, 
this would give us a partial scoring. And our zones were measured from the edge of the paper disc out to the point of the zone. In terms of structure and identification after the bioassays, these metabolites and extracts would be annotated and ID'd by a high-res LCMS MS as well as NMR prior to isolation. Our high-res LCMS MS analysis is done by Dr. Neha Gard and her team at Georgia Tech that do many of the annotations in GNPS as well as some other in silico tools, which is currently being worked on at the moment. And so far in the past six months, with the introduction of these classic natural product isolation media techniques to this probiotic, this new, this probiotic team, I have isolated over 400 new isolates, keeping Vibria species at a minimal in my collection, and that were ultimately screened against the putative coral associated pathogens. 152 of those strains displayed inhibitory activity against the putative pathogens. And 11 different Florida coral species were sampled in varying levels of susceptibility to the stony coral tissue loss disease. In terms of our RNA sequencing, 16S RNA sequencing, 152 strains had obtained, were obtained, had taxonomy obtained. Many isolates were slow growing bacteria with interesting morphology, which led to the identification of the closest taxon genus for 14 of them being actinobacteria, such as Clinkia, Pseudonocardia, Gordonia, Micromonospora, Streptomyces, et cetera. And so from those 14, I have showed, I'm showing about 10 out of the 14. Many of them have varying uh, morphologies as well as different sources of where they came from. And so I wanna just go through a little bit of the chemistry that was found and ID'd on some of the select extracts. Aeromicrobium species, where it's uh, 16S ID was closest to Aeromicrobium erythrium with a net almost 100% similarity, was isolated from a couple of Colpophila natans coral. In terms of its activity against the antibiotic naldixic acid, Fractions four and five were the most potent against the real coralliticus. So what could be contributing to that activity? I wanted to compare against a known genome of aeromicrobium erythrium to see what type of natural products it may produce. It produces two main ones that showed a, a pretty good similarity score in anti-smash such as erythromycin and dex desoferooxamine B a known siderophore from several uh, bacteria. In terms of the NMR and LCMS, I was able to identify desferooxamine B in the LCMS, as well as some key peaks in the NMR of the extract. Erythromycin was also present in the NMR of the extract with some of the shifts of the classic sugar moieties, as well as the or cycle, macro cycle. This is still being confirmed with LCMS to make sure that erythromycin is indeed produced. The next bacteria that I looked at that also had uh, good activity was a microbacterium species. Microbacterium oliverans had 100% similarity and again was isolated from a colopophyll Colopophila natans coral. I had partial activity, but still warranted to see what type of natural products were produced by this bacteria. In terms of a known genome, it has a very small genome from a known uh, sequenced and not a ton of matches in anti-smash for similarity, so making dereplication a bit different. So in terms of what might be present, we, may th we believe that there may be some sort of antimyosin-like metabolites that could be present based on some of the shifts and some of the previous literature indicating its closest relative, microbacterium, testosium, may have produced this antimyosin-like metabolites. 
And finally, streptomyces uh, with the 99% similarity to streptomyces lacodlatospora, which was isolated from a coral source of Orbicella flaviola. flaviola. It is has potent activity in fractions four and five, very large zones of inhibition against Vibrio corallidicus. Unfortunately, it didn't have a full genome. Uh, so its closest relative, Streptomyces brevispora, has very large amount of metabolites it may produce according to anti-SMASH in order to look for potential metabolites that my strain produces. And in terms of potential natural products and the potential activity from the NMR of the extract, the LCMS was inconclusive, but the NMR indicated siderophores, which are typically antibiotics in our case found in the streptomyces species. More work is still being done as these are being actively ran at the moment and more structures will be uh, defined in the next coming, coming months. Another interesting thing to, another interesting observation that I noticed in my isolation efforts of these actinobacteria was the sources in terms of where they from healthy corals. As I said, we wanted to get probiotic strains or potential probiotic bacterial strains from healthy corals, but many of them actually come from disease. A majority of them, over half of them come from disease sources, indicating this might be an interesting trend to follow up on. Why are we seeing more actinobacteria specifically at the disease lesion site? And so I hope that today I showed you that corals, are, corals can provide a unique source of bacteria. Coral reefs are important in our subtropical and tropical regions since they provide protection, shelter, and income. And many, and currently Florida corals are experiencing an unprecedented disease outbreak since 2014, affecting over almost 100,000 acres and over half of the reef building species. Probiotics could be a treatment alternative to antibiotics and microorganisms derived from healthy corals could serve as the probiotics. And using some of the classic media isolation techniques, actinobacteria were derived from the tissues of coral with bioactivity against putative coral pathogens. In terms of future direction, we are working to identify the active metabolites in the actinobacteria strains and isolate any potential new natural products. Genome sequencing will start as well with some of our select actinobacteria. Then we hope to initially start with aquarium probiotic testing where we will have corals from the diseased, cor diseased coral from the field, which will undergo aquarium probiotic testing, as well as potential field testing at our Florida testing sites. And with that, I'd like to thank my current lab members in, the, in Dr. Valerie Paul's lab, as well as funding agencies such as the Moat Protect Our Reefs Young Investigator Award, and as well as our collaborators, Dr. Julie Meyer and Dr. Neha Garg. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Hi, Paige. Hey. Thanks for the lovely talk. Yeah, no problem. Um, yes, as you said, I think we can go to questions. And the first question is from Jessica. The question is, have you noticed any pattern between the susceptibility of the source coral and the activity of the isolated bacteria? It, for example, do you see more active bacteria isolated from the M. carvanosa less susceptible compared to the activity of the bacteria isolated from C. natans more susceptible? Would you like me to repeat that? No, I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm trying to go through all my bacteria list <laughs> in terms of what I saw the most active. Um, I definitely saw more that my diseased isolates, regardless of if they were gram negative or gram positive, they were much more active. I saw a larger pool of active strains from the diseased coral. In terms of coral species and susceptibility, 
uh, I don't believe there was much of a pattern yet to establish. Okay, um, I guess that will unravel as the work goes on. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me check that if there's any more questions. Oli, any more questions from the YouTube chat? I think, I think that's it in the chat. Um, very interesting work. Um, we appreciate you coming to our platform and sharing your work with us. Oh, no um, problem. We wish best with your future endeavors at the Smithsonian Marine Station and with all the work that you're doing there. Yeah, of course. Uh, I guess uh, August also has a question. Um, there could be another question. Oh, yes, Agri has one. Hi, Paige. Thank Hi. you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions, but they are just curiosity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you mentioned that you have 400 new isolates, right? That's a yes. lot. And yes. Regarding the, the, the percentage of the 16S, uh, do mm -hmm. you have or you think you have maybe some new strains? Um, not that I'm aware of. They matched with some uh, well-studied cousins or relatives of that strain. So I don't believe I have any new strains. Or species, no. So the no. ID is really high, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, we'll see with the genome sequencing and double check, but as far as I can tell, at least with the 16S barcode, they are not new species. Okay, and regarding the genome sequence, um, how did you sequence those genomes? What platform did you use for oh, the I ones that you showed? Uh, I haven't done, oh, the ones that I show on Anti-Smash, I found them online. Uh, so those were ones that matched in my uh, blast search of the 16S barcode. Uh, so they are not like your isolates? No, no, I am hoping okay, okay. To, to do some genome sequ sequence on some of those isolates. Uh, Ju okay. Dr. Julie Meyer is the main one who does our genome sequencing. And which platform are you thinking of using? That I don't know yet. Um, okay. I have to talk to her more about that. I am uh, not super well uh, informed on the genome platforms quite yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. If not, I think we can close today's talk.